Our scripture this morning starts with a people full of anticipation and wondering in their hearts. Is this John the Baptist going to be their Messiah? Which we all know today that he wasn't the guy, but they don't know that yet. They know that he's coming soon, like any minute kind of soon, and that the Messiah is coming to save them. And they had no clue what was in store for them. They were thinking save on a much smaller scale. They were dreaming of a savior, a king of kings, that would come in with his mighty army and destroy their oppressors. The good guys crushing the bad guys. So that Israel would finally be safe, be allowed to prosper, to continue their way of living, but better. And the Jewish people, they knew suffering, the bloodshed of wars that had been waged against them, their enslavement in Egypt under Pharaoh. And now things were beginning to feel like they were headed back in that direction, with the powers that be placing more and more restrictions upon them. And so in that moment, they are filled with anticipation. Is it him? Is it John the Baptist? And John must have had a way with words. He was a pretty big deal. We know this because he's mentioned in all four of the Gospels. People traveled from all over Judea to hear him preach and to be baptized by him. Even Jesus would eventually come to this man and ask him to do the same. What was taking place in that river was a profound experience for the people gathered there. John was calling them, demanding that they be remorseful for the wrongs that they have done, to then receive the gift of God's grace, and to go out and live a life that is wholly transformed by that grace. He would dip them in the river, marking that moment the moment of commitment to live in service to God and to God's people. Last year, I got to travel to the Holy Land. Over the course of 10 days, we zigzagged across Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. And one of the coolest stops was along the banks of the Jordan River at the site where Jesus was baptized. Or at least that was according to the plaque that hung on the wall as you entered. And I was excited about this stop because I had brought with me from America two pressurized containers to collect water from the river to bring home with me. And on the way there, some of the other students and I kind of nervously questioned each other. Are you going to go in? Uh, well, I don't, can you go in? I don't know. Are you going to go in? I think, well, I think I'm going to go in. I, I don't know if I'm going to go in. Our nervousness, well, I guess I can only speak for myself. My nervousness came from not being sure what we were supposed to do once we got there. What do you do when you find yourself at the place where Jesus was baptized? How do you mark that moment, that memory, as holy and significant? Do you go into the water, or is that disrespectful? Because I, I know you're only supposed to be baptized once, and I've already been baptized, so what does that even mean? I had no idea what to expect, but I knew that we were only going to have one chance to be here, and we wanted to make sure we'd get the most out of it. So when we walked down the wooden stairs towards the water's edge, the first thing that struck me was that the water was brown like milky solid you have no idea what's in there kind of brown and now i'm not sure if this caused my classmates to pause but i will admit there was a moment where i thought to myself okay how is this going to work and as my mind continued to race i started to feel like maybe i was going to lose my nerve so i decided you know what first things first let's get those water bottles filled and so i leaned over to fill up my water bottles from the river 
And while I did, a new group arrived at the shore. I actually could hear them as they were approaching. They were chanting in a language that I didn't understand, but it was haunting and it was beautiful. I watched as the priest guided the people gently into the water. Everyone would get their turn, but as they waited, and even after they had had their turn, they stood in solidarity with their group holding this space, serving as a loving witness. You couldn't help but feel the power of that moment. And so I found a quiet corner a little ways off from there. I took my shoes off and rolled up my pants and began to wade out into the water. And one of my favorite songs, an African-American spiritual, came to mind, and I sang it softly to myself. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, oh, who shall wear the story crown? Good Lord, show me the way. As I was crying, the tears were falling down my cheeks, and I bent down and I scooped up some of the water, and I brought it to my forehead, and I prayed. Of course, I didn't need to know ahead of time what was going to be the right thing to do. I just needed to show up, admit that I had no idea what was going on, and to stay present in the moment, to let go and let myself be loved by God. Jesus wasn't alone when he was baptized. As the holiest person that ever lived, you'd think that he'd just be able to baptize himself. Maybe like block off the whole river for the day. This is going to be a holy moment. In fact, Jesus didn't really need to be baptized at all. He hasn't committed any sins. Why was Jesus baptized? I went searching for some answers on this, and it turns out that Bible scholars and theologians aren't really sure either. I actually love that, that Jesus' actions all these years later are still keeping us on our toes. Jesus made this completely unexpected choice, not only to be baptized, but to join with the community of people who were there on that day, to wade into the water with them, and to make a commitment. And then he prayed. And while he was praying, the skies break open and the Holy Spirit descends in a bodily form like a dove. And God says, you are my beloved. You are my own. We know that Jesus would devout, devout his life to teaching the people that he wasn't the only one, that we too are God's beloved. We hold within us the divine spark that is uniquely us and uniquely God. God expresses who God is through us, through our actions, through our lives, through who we are. And it's tempting to think, well, if I do all the things I'm supposed to, then maybe I'll deserve that love a little more than if I didn't. But that's not how it works. Three years ago, on a warm Sunday afternoon in October, Kelly and I met under the shade of a big oak tree to join as one in holy matrimony. And in the presence of our closest friends and family and goats, it was a unique service. There was this moment. We had cried through our vows and exchanged the rings. And right before our minister would pronounce us officially married, she turned to those gathered and asked them to make a commitment of their own, to bless and support our marriage to help us grow in love in the coming days and years. I believe there is a power when a group of people make a common vow, a common commitment in love. We make commitments like that here, together, as a church family. When we baptize someone, 
When a new member decides to officially join our church, we make a commitment to them, to walk alongside them, to support them, to love them. And it's not perfect. Sometimes, a lot of times, we fall short in our commitment to love and support one another. But here, in this place, we get to practice. We get to practice over and over to love one another better, and also to practice receiving that love, to practice being vulnerable. Jesus served as the ultimate example. When he stepped forward to be baptized, he showed us what it looks like to humble ourselves and to receive that gift of love. And that's hard, isn't it? It doesn't seem like it would be, but I'd much rather be on the giving and providing side of things instead of the taking and receiving side. But that's where the power is. We aren't given this gift of grace because we deserve it. We're given the gift of God's grace because it is the only thing that can free us from ourselves. It is the only thing that can transform us in ways we never imagined. And the world could certainly use a little more of that. Today marks the 23rd day that our government has been shut down. A new record, apparently. 23 days in which thousands of people who've had to work with no paycheck or aren't allowed to work at all. Both of the opposing sides that are currently in a standoff seem just as entrenched as they were on day one. And I don't know if you're hoping for the Democrats to stand their ground, to not give in to bullying, or whether you believe that a border wall is what this country desperately needs to be safe, but it certainly feels like we're all hoping and praying for the good guys to crush the bad guys, just like the Jewish people who were eagerly awaiting their Messiah. Jesus' answer to this us versus them was not what they expected, and it continues to challenge us today. I'm not saying that it isn't our duty as Christians to call out the injustices in this world, to stand up for those who have been wronged, because it is. But I'm asking you to consider just for a moment the possibility that what we are doing here in this community of practice might also be an important part of the solution. You know, church is one of those few places left where you don't get to decide who walks in that door. More and more, we surround ourselves with people who agree with us, think like us, vote like us, live like us. But I bet if you look around, you can find someone in this church that doesn't look like you, that doesn't live like you, Or maybe they even get their news from a place that you'd never consider getting your news. And maybe that's the perfect place to start, to practice loving and to practice receiving. What would it look like if you allowed yourself to be transformed by God's love? What would it feel like if you opened yourself to the possibility that God can and does move through you in this world. You are God's beloved. You are God's beloved, and it is my hope that we can all try to walk towards living like it. Amen.